Every full moon, seek out conversations with people that make you feel safe in an unsafe way. Today is the full moon in Vancouver, Canada, and I feel very, very safe with you. Probably have told you many things I wouldn't tell lots of other people, that's for sure. Uh, but that also is because I tell you things that I feel very unsafe telling people. And when I think about what makes me feel unsafe right now, it's that we're going to have this conversation on the internet. And I find that the internet is a very scary place. Um, this conversation in relation to the full moon is interesting only because my body is in a very full moon space today which is always hard for me to have a clear mind or to feel like I can sound intelligent or like come up with complete thoughts when I'm in a full moon body state so that's the other thing that's very interesting for me do you feel safe and unsafe In my relationship with you, I definitely do feel safe because there has been radical acts of uh, revealing ourselves to one another over the course of the years that we have been friends and that has never been transgressed. Mm. I also feel unsafe, again, not with you, but because... I am in a place in my life right now where I feel very vulnerable to being judged by others. And so having a conversation live online means that it lives outside of my relationships. And I, okay, so in my life right now, I am thinking about justice a lot and radical forms of justice. And part of thinking about justice at this moment in time for me is thinking about shame. Mm. And shame is really, for me at least, the imagination and or reality of being judged by others, kind of like outside of my control. And by outside of my control, I mean judgments coming that... Um, are made by people that are not willing to speak to me or engage with me directly. Mm -hmm. And so this sort of compounds what the internet produces, which is this, um, yeah, this publicness. Mm. Do you feel like there are two forms of shame? Like the one that you um, put on yourself, create yourself, decide to take on, and the shame that's like created exterior. Because, you know, when I think about shame in the way that people, or maybe I imagine it like physically, you know, it's like towns throwing rocks at people or, you know, beating gay people, beating women up, beating political groups up. You know, shame can be a physical, you know, uh, transference from one person to the other. But then there's also just the shame that I know, you know, no one else is giving me. I'm creating it. I mean, it definitely stems from an idea that's being given to me by society about who or what I should be or should be doing. But I'm choosing to take that on or I'm not. This is totally separate from the Internet, by the way, because everything you said about the Internet, I completely agree with. I'm just in this other thing of like, what is shame? I'm very interested in that, like. Do you think there's only one kind or is there multiple kinds? Do we have control over any of them? I'm definitely not an expert in how our emotional landscapes break down on like a physiological or psychological level. I do um, understand the distinction that you're trying to make between I'm alone in my room feeling shame mm -hmm. versus I'm being publicly shamed. Those are not equivalent, but I do think, for me at least, 
sitting in a room feeling shame is about the imagination of other people. And Mm -hmm. uh, to try and draw a distinction here, I think that maybe guilt is the Mm -hmm. thing that uh, is a word that better describes for me, at least the experience of being alone in my room and feeling shitty about the thing that I've done. Mm. Yeah, I don't know. Shame turns me into an object. Whereas, like, guilt allows me (laughs) to still be a subject. Wow. (laughs) I have to think about that one. I just came up with that. Yeah, I really have to think about that. Guilt allows me to be a subject. Because I, in my life... I mean, I don't, you, this is so semantics, right? And the moments in which people have used these words at you, around you, in relation to things you were listening to, that you create meaning. And for me, guilt has somehow obtained the meaning of like completely created outside me. Like mm. so much guilt has been fed to me. Like this is what you should feel guilty for. This is, this is the thing that is wrong and then if you do this if you are a part of this then feel guilt even if you're not a part of it if you extend from it in any way Mm -hmm. this is the guilt you should carry um and I you know choose to accept some of that and be like yeah that's true I I do feel guilty about that I am willing to take on that guilt um and try to use it towards something else or just shouldn't sit in my room and feel shitty about it Shame, I sometimes feel like entirely create myself, even though, you know, if I sit down and really think about where those ideas come from, they do come from teachings in a very early part of my life. But I definitely create it all the time in myself. It's funny, I had my, my, you know, boyfriend, partner, person, he has a friend group and they have a game called shame yes. and the game is <laughs> the game is that you i forgot the game but you basically it's something it's a drinking game you drink around a table and if you don't do it fast enough or something if maybe you have to get a ball in a cup i forget but if you don't do it fast enough and you're the last person everyone around the table yells shame shame <laughs> and you have to drink and I hate it. I hate it so much. I have such a physical reaction to this game. But what I noticed when I started, like, really observing it, because I don't always play, is that all the men think it's hilarious and oh all the women hate it. <laughs> None of the women want to play. They all have a much more, like, hurt facial expression when they get shamed for whatever. And the men think it's hilarious. And I am not saying, I just had a very big debate with an artist friend of mine about whether really men are women and women are different or aren't. I'm not saying that, you know, I want to put a line in the sand that all men feel this way and all women don't. I'm sure there's tons of men who hate that game also. Um, but I think it would be really hard to find a woman who loved it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, I really don't think I'd actually have a very easy time finding a woman who loved having the word shame yelled at her for any reason. When I think about what shame produces, to me, shame only produces a kind of dehumanization, Mm -hmm. which I see reflected in your story of people, you know, crumpling under the, the being, I don't know, having aspersions cast at them, whether it's in a game or not. (laughs) And I, again, I think that, one difference between shame and guilt might be that guilt is trying to teach us something. So looping Mm -hmm. back to what you were saying about guilt feeling like it's coming from the outside and having this kind of pedantic overtone, I think that's really insightful, actually, because Mm -hmm. guilt is um, a kind of mechanism to show us when we have transgressed our own ethics or morality or society's ethics and morality, Mm -hmm. whether or not we agree with them. And it's meant to produce a change in behavior. Mm. Whereas shame, I mean, at this moment in time, looping back to the internet, shame is more or less equivalent to a kind of cancellation. Mm. And that is really 
the removal of somebody from community, from life. And removing somebody from relation with other people is so fucking violent and destructive. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I understand in cases like Harvey Weinstein or other people, you know, that the cancellation is necessary. Mm -hmm. But I think it is really wielded indiscriminately at this moment in time and wielded with a kind of political rhetoric that doesn't take seriously uh, what shame produces for the people that are shamed. And I guess I say doesn't take it seriously because feeling oneself be removed from their relationships becomes a kind of um, justification for retribution or like further harm and you know there's many um, studies that have been done about uh, the relationship between shame and recidivism for people that have been incarcerated and I think that those kinds of correlations probably hold in a non-carceral situation as well when we're talking about these like public shaming or cancellation campaigns that happen more or less entirely through social media these days. Can you define recidivism for those that are not? Oh, yeah. People who uh, go to jail and then are released and commit crimes again, commit Mm -hmm. the same crimes again. I don't know if it is necessarily related to the same crimes, but somebody who, you know, ostensibly goes through a rehabilitation Mm -hmm. only to actually not be rehabilitated and have to repeat their Mm -hmm. harm. Because this is a... (laughs) <laughs> conversation with a safe person in an unsafe way. Although I guess the definition was to have a conversation with someone who makes you feel safe in an unsafe way. It wasn't necessarily to have an unsafe conversation with a person who makes you feel safe. Although that's so, distinction, I would like to maybe just pause there for yeah. a moment because the direction that we've been handed mm-hmm. to have a conversation with a safe person who makes you feel unsafe? No, to f- have a conversation with a person you feel safe with in an unsafe way. Okay, that I feels think. more unsafe than having an unsafe <laughs> conversation with, with a the person, person that you makes feel you feel safe. safe. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I should really get the in- direction out again, but what I find really interesting about the conversation we're having is that I'm so tempted to say something super unsafe because it will go on the internet. You know, like, again, this conversation between you and I, the things people say to each other in their homes, the things they say to their lovers, like, you can't repeat that to anyone. Mm -hmm. The internet, the idea of throwing our every thought into a social forum has really made some people who maybe guard their anonymity or who are somehow capable of not reading comments and so are you know, divorced from the outcomes of what they do, or maybe they thrive off that. I'm not so sure. It somehow changed people into having those things that they say in private public. Now, some people get really upset about that, right? Like it should have stayed indoors. Is it that they're saying it publicly that we should be upset about, or is it what they're saying that we should be upset about? And I do feel like that sometimes gets mixed up are angry at the wrong thing and to (laughs) and then to now risk it I will say to to the you know canceling shame all that stuff certainly people who abuse other people shouldn't have access to people but does it serve like you were talking about rehabilitation for somebody who has committed crimes towards others to be made invisible in every way, you know, eliminated from their jobs, their family, and also the internet. Now they've become ghosts and we don't know anything about them. And we're giving them no access to any kind of rehabilitation because these people are not necessarily you know, even in the case of Harvey Weinstein and some others like him, are not even necessarily getting jail time or getting any sort of forced help. So how is it as a society that we are ensuring that they are having to face not just 
punishment in a way that maybe only further uh, angers them and makes them feel entitled because, you know, the world has done them wrong, but actually includes them in a conversation about why. And so I'm not sure like canceling benefits anything ever. Like I'm not, yeah. Um, I, uh, okay, hold on. Let me compile my thoughts here. Yeah, I'm, I'm already scared by what I just said. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying, I'm sure I didn't, you know, communicate everything that I meant there, but yeah. I think it's really difficult to think about what justice can mean in a productive way when you have somebody who's not willing to admit that they caused harm. Mm, true. But also, I think it's something that our criminal legal system mm. produces. There is no mechanism in the way that, uh, you know, courts and laws currently function that would allow to admit guilt in a way that didn't, mm. yeah, I, would... I don't know, harm him further. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't know, that's not a reason to not admit guilt, but I am saying that his obstinance is probably produced in part maybe by the way that our criminal legal system is organized. Yeah, I think when we put people on the defensive and then we say that they're not willing to admit the truth, we've created the situation in which truth can't be told. Fear changes people. It Mm -hmm. It turns them into things that you cannot even imagine having I mean I've never experienced that level of fear but I you know have been truly afraid and in retrospect been amazed by the differences in my decision making when I was that afraid and so I think that human psychology and what we know about our behavior in a kind of fight or flight situation determines a lot about how bad bad people seem you know and if it was much more about like okay so you no longer have access to xyz because it's not safe for you to be around people or have that level of power but we would like you to come over here and have these conversations and see a counselor regularly because you don't wake up a person who does this like Something has to have happened to you in your life to cause you to need that kind of control or power or abuse over others. And so we're going to dig into that because we need you to walk out onto the street every day as a person who's like more aware. And even though maybe we're taking some of your power away, we, we still can't send you out into the world as you are because that's not functioning. And, and we need you to be able to buy groceries and, mm-hmm. you know, do whatever. And so that's more what I mean is like, yeah shifting their circumstances rather than just simply forcing them into the dark and never seeing them again, which I don't think has ever served anything very well. I I mean, I'm going to let you say anything else you want to say about that, but then I was going to shift back to the internet. Uh, I think shift back to the internet. You know, the more we know, the more terrifying everything becomes, the more defensive we all become, the more ready we are to find anything that we can that we can make change around and so we we search the internet for people that we believe we can yell at that we can change that we can you know force into a different situation because my favorite story is this i'm talking a lot i'll stop after this i went i lived on this little island in greece i think i've told you this story before and um, this guy, a bunch of guys in a bar once told me about how there had been no TV on the island. When I lived there, they were just getting internet. They didn't have internet before that. I think this is like in the early 2000s. And they didn't have TV previously. And when they got TV, they said that, you know, it used to be that if one person in the village, um, got sick or lost their job, people would rally around that family and help them. And that when the TV was introduced and people started getting more involved in like world news, there was the slow breakdown between, because there are several villages on the island, that people no longer would go and rally around somebody if things went wrong because, and this was the theory of the person in the bar, 
it just became overwhelming. You know, you realize that everyone in the world was suffering, that everything bad was happening, that they couldn't change anything. And suddenly there was no mental space to go help, you know, George or Anita who was suffering. And I found that really interesting because I wonder if the internet is doing that to us, that we are becoming paralyzed by the amount of knowledge we have and at the same time more ferocious because of the amount of knowledge we have. I wonder what causes people to behave the way that they behave online when, in my experience, it's so often very different from how they behave when we are fleshy bodies yeah. with one another. Totally. Like, what is it about the technology that produces um, a person's capacity to uh, behave against the choices that they'd make if they were witness behaving in that way. I'm, 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 I, f I feel certain based on nothing other than my feelings mm. <laughs> that it's the anonymity in some way, you know, mm. even if it is, you know, even if you're on Instagram making mean comments about somebody with your own account, there's still a kind of um, anonymity in the sense that you aren't being witnessed mm -hmm. same. making those same comments to the person in real life or maybe not even you know articulating those comments amongst a group of friends when you're talking shit about somebody like the discourse just in my experience feels so different than anything that happens away from the keyboard <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean it's so cultural too though right because like is the internet just a culture like is that really about anonymity or is it about this kind of like um are we immigrants to a space that shows us what is acceptable like you think about people who go to another country mm -hmm. and suddenly it's acceptable to do x which wasn't acceptable back where they came from and so they adopt that behavior and because they want to be part of that culture like is the internet a world that simply has prescribed behaviors and we are all immigrants to it and there is some ruling body that we're not totally getting, or maybe mm -hmm. some of us are, who's determining those social behaviors in this new world. Because sometimes when I go into certain digital spaces that are more focused on, say, people in tech or whatever, or cultural spaces or religious spaces, you know, the social etiquette of those spaces is not the same as a TikTok or a Facebook or an Instagram. So anonymity is not causing it it's like mm. the literal world you're in it's like standing in france versus standing in canada you're standing on a are these micro worlds micro countries something like that i don't know where i went with that i feel like i took us way off track yeah i'm not sure where we're at either <laughs> but i do keep having this memory as i listen to you talk which dates back to when Donald Trump was first elected president in the United States. And I remember there being this wave of conversation from BIPOC folks uh, in response to his blatant racism that was a kind of um, gratitude, let's say, that he was saying those things out loud because the things that he was saying out loud were the things that were conditioning these people's lives I'm saying this as a white woman, mm -hmm. were uh, the things that were conditioning these people's lives their entire life. Mm -hmm. Only now somebody was like saying the quiet parts out loud. Right. Yeah. And so I also wonder, is there some kind of um, metaphorical lesson to take from those observations to the conversation that we're trying to have about public shaming and cancellation now, which is that these kinds of I don't know, uh, like, I guess gossip, you know, has always happened. It's just now happening in a way that has different kinds of repercussions. I'm not sure. I'm not sure at all about that analogy. Uh, and I'm definitely not sure about it because I feel that as a woman, you know, linking back to like ugh, the conversations we were having earlier, <laughs> uh, gossip has often made me safer 
Ooh, you know, interesting. In what way? Claire. Well, you know, other women telling me like that person is a bad person. Oh, like, don't be alone with them. Yeah, yeah. You know that kind of stuff. It's like never things that I'm asking for um, documentary proof about their bad man behavior. I'm just mm-hmm. like listening to the things that are told to me, and then not mm-hmm. putting myself in a position where I'm alone and or drunk and or vulnerable around those people. Yeah. And you know, I haven't been raped and so thank god yeah you know like also how rare yeah yeah seriously how rare but also perhaps because i've been surrounded by people that have been generous enough to like share that kind of information with me Mm -hmm. in a way that is for all intents and purposes talking shit Mm -hmm. gossip the way you're describing it is a hundred percent useful but then it's so interesting you know when you put people into a situation of nothing but shaming them publicly Mm -hmm. they become more violent you know, there's the pot- there's the potential that you become more endangered, and and so we're like back to this thing about shame, <laughs> you know, like we use it as a way to get rid of quote unquote the people who could harm us, the way of avoiding quote unquote the people who could harm us, and then it has all of these ripple effects where those people become more defensive, more abusive, and more violent because, you know, nothing is happening to them in terms of reconciliation or or what's the other word, rehabilitation or whatever. The only thing that's happening to them is shame. So interesting though <laughs> that we've gotten in a loop there. But uh, yeah, I think that I was talking to somebody yesterday because they were saying sometimes I take my children to the downtown east side, which is a very, very poor uh, neighborhood with a lot of drug addiction and prostitution and human trafficking and you name it, we've got it in that area of Vancouver. They drive their children down there because they say things like, if you don't do X, if you don't succeed, if you do whatever, you could end up here. And, uh, And more than one person was saying it. And the other person who was saying it was actually running a non-for-profit that included um, subsidized housing and things like that for people. And after they were sort of saying their piece, I said, you know, what if we didn't point at that and say to our children, if you don't succeed, if you don't behave, if you don't whatever, you'll end up here. What if we said, it's okay to fail, and if you get here, you could still get out. You know what I mean? Why do we continuously teach perfection, teach fear of failure, teach all of those things? Sorry. Or why do we also allow those folks that are struggling on the downtown east side to be (laughs) less than human? (laughs) Right? And why are they the example of what not to be? Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, totally. Uh, I do like the... um, I don't know, the thing that you're pointing to about us needing to get really comfortable with failing and understanding that that's actually a point of, uh, an opportunity for growth rather than a kind of final destination. Mm -hmm. But the other thing that I think is really misguided in the story that you were telling about this person pointing to these people Mm -hmm. is that it doesn't take systemic issues or Mm. historical issues seriously it's like those people aren't there because they failed those people are there because we have made a society in which that is fucking possible and so I mean it'd be yeah I wonder to provide another kind of counter proposal like what if this parent drove their children down there and said these are the people that you need to fucking like help this is the situation Or not that they need to help them, but, like, here's the situation that our world currently produces. Can you make a better world in which this is fucking impossible? Well, so (laughs) I I skipped the first half of that conversation, which was when they were talking about their children all being more environmentally conscious and, like, always giving them shit for the things that they do that are not environmentally conscious and how, you know, all this stuff about how they're going to make a better world, but that they thought that they were lazy and whatever, which is where then they got into these other things, that they cared too much about fun, I think was the really bizarre (laughs) point. And and so in the first half of that conversation, you know, uh, one of the people there said something like, I do realize that my generation, you know, we didn't make a political difference. We didn't 
noticed these people the way that we should have or, you know, made sure that someone was providing real resources, we let the mental health hospital on Hastings close down. We let those things happen. And I said, yeah, like, let's teach our kids to vote differently. Mm -hmm. Like, let's point at that and say, do not allow this to continue. This has been going on for too long. You want to be the generation that changes something? Here's something that's really, truly been the epic failure of every generation before you. And that's not because addiction is going to suddenly disappear and you're going to solve it. That's not because, you know, poverty isn't a problem that's embedded in way more problems. It's none of those things. It's just that the system we have for how we help those people live and survive does not include any kind of health care, does not include any kind of mental health or access assistance or access to housing or a job assistance. It's really all of our solutions have been Band-Aid solutions, and it's because we elect governments who think that way and who benefit from their poverty. And, mm -hmm. and really, truly, I could go so much deeper, not only benefit from their poverty, but require the other industries that the downtown east side is kind of the access of you know well maybe to <laughs> tie this up into a bow yeah um, we, need to tie it up into a bow. we should perhaps advocate for a system of direct democracy enabled mm. through the internet <laughs> In order to solve all of our social problems. I mean, okay, blockchain. I, think, uh, I mean, we're now we're now about to compete with like eighty like eighty um, podcasts about DAOs. But um, oh my god, I have so many things to say about that. I, I mean, uh, I think that right now. Most of the things that are being done with blockchain, which allows people to collectively own things and vote on things, just to give a little explanation there in a very, you know, succinct way that doesn't explain all the details. Um, it's only reproducing capitalism. Literally, that's all that it's doing is reproducing a capitalist democracy or a version of neoclassic democracy or any of those things. It's not, nobody has really changed the game yet because they are finding ways to, I mean, the most interesting things are when they find ways to self-sustain by creating an economy that then is allowing some of those people who contribute to building the thing to also earn from the thing. That's maybe the most revolutionary moment because of the sustainability it offers a contractor or things like that, uh, or the equity it offers a person who supports something that you know wouldn't normally pay them just for their support. But if you really want to change democracy, you'd have to go down into the downtown east side, get everybody a web development degree, mm -hmm. somehow create a mental health program and a and you know a housing program and an access to tech program and all kinds of things because those people are not there. So even if we you know, completely change the voting system, we do whatever, our education system, our access to education, our determination to make kids who are also hungry and tired and dealing with abuse to keep going to school and realize they can have a better life if they do X or Y or make a new world on this mm -hmm. one. Like, we, we need to do so much more than the internet to make it valuable. No, I and I totally support this vision that you're proposing, however likely or unlikely it might be of like going into the downtown east side and like giving everybody access to education <laughs> so that they can remake the system from the ground up. Um, but I guess, I mean, I was saying it a bit um, maybe cynically pointing to direct democracy, but I do think that, again, okay, looping back to the beginning of our conversation and about internet and Fear. Mm. There is a link between the mm. lives that we live online and the lives that we live away from the keyboard. And so if we grant this, mm. there has to be a way that it isn't just reproducing shit mm. or exacerbating shit. There has to be a way yeah. that we can make the link between our digital lives and our fleshy lives in a way that serves I don't know. Yeah, the the betterment of our 
of ourselves and our relationships. And that sounds totally naive, but also why not? I don't know. I mean, I totally agree with you and not to like, I guess we're playing good cop, bad cop, but I, I just, it just like reoccurred to me as you were talking, but like the thing that women, especially particularly women's movements have been so excited about is that for the very first time ever, what they say on the internet actually can take away some of those jobs. Yeah. yeah, it actually can ruin their life. It actually can have an effect. And so it's interesting that, like, that is revolutionary, you know? Saying, some, saying somebody did something bad usually for hundreds of years only hurt the accuser. Mm-hmm. It didn't hurt the accused. And so that switch is pretty revolutionary, actually. But at the same time, there are, like, all the, all the other impacts that we've listed that are not great and not how we should build the new world. And so, yeah, it's interesting because obviously I 100% agree with you. There is now a direct correlation between our physical and our digital selves and how do we, or how do we consider those relationships more? And also how do we give that relationship to people who don't have access and are kind of being left out? But then at the same time, not reverse the revolution that is having direct impact on those who do wrong. I mean, I want to do maybe the opposite of yes and <laughs> to be like, I don't know, uh, not or or something, yeah, um, which is that it is fucking bullshit that people who have historically spoken out about being abused mm-hmm. have been the people that have suffered the consequ- consequences of that public speech and not the abusers themselves. Yeah. That is fucking bullshit. But also, I mean, I think like it is not good enough in my humble opinion to just reproduce harm it's not good enough there has to be a way of you know responding to people that have caused harm to other people in a way that doesn't just destroy them there just has to be a way yeah no both of those things are fucking wrong Mm -hmm. and the way forward is neither of those ways I don't know what that means. I mean, the pendulum swung, swing in history has always been, you know, nothing happening and war. Mm-hmm. And then there's, like, middle. And whether the middle has ever actually succeeded at being that middle, you know, I've, when, I look at the, when I look at the last middle period, it doesn't really feel like it. But then if you look at the periods before it, it did have a lot of effect and, and make a lot of change. So, I don't know, maybe you only get so much change at any one time in history. But... It does feel like violence for violence is right now we're in that pendulum swing, right? A lot of harm, a lot of retribution, and that there has to be a middle ground. But sadly, we always have to come through this place in, in, as humans where like there's a lot of punishment going on. And then we all see, hopefully, that that wasn't the way. And then we, we come back down and we, we look to people like Dalai Lamas and we, we hope for a different kind of future but what gets me is you know oh god the policing system and what I'm seeing there and yeah and some of the things that people say about I just don't think that that I think that system is fundamentally exactly what you're describing that we think that the only way to deal with violence is violence Mm -hmm. and we are terrified of someone being able to do more violence to us than we are able to do with them so we produce entire institutions dedicated to performing violence if we need them to and that in itself if we can rethink the police system then society can rethink violence and retribution as a whole but the police system is the one that everything they do just reinforces that that is the only solution to a problem you know military included in that and until we find a different way which unfortunately would require an entire global culture change oh god when I say that out loud I think it's impossible and it's never going to happen and I get very sad Yeah, I just wonder why it doesn't make us fall to our knees when we recognize the link between uh, 
the experience of violence when we are the people that are being acted upon Mm -hmm. versus the experience of violence when we abstract it out to like the criminal legal system or police or what have you. Like those things are so similar. Like there's just, there's like, what is the fucking difference between, I don't know, somebody being shot by somebody who's not a cop versus somebody being shot by a cop like it's the fucking same you know and how does that not yeah it just causes us to fall to our knees and fucking like pray for a different way forward I don't know man yeah no and I love the sentence you just said abstract violence out Mm -hmm. to other institutions yeah I mean super depressing bow but that feels like a bow to me (laughs) <laughs> yeah. for the conversation right. <laughs> but yeah so thanks for this safe conversation in an unsafe way anytime my friend <laughs> yeah I hope that I hope we both survive it <laughs> okay yeah, but seriously maybe we won't <laughs> that's totally being included <laughs> thank you <laughs>